And we are here for part two of our candidates preview. We are joined by the official numbers correspondent. He is just finding out that he's being called the official numbers correspondent of Perpetual Chess. He is the writer of the indispensable chess blog and Twitter account, Chess by the Numbers. Uh, our guest, Ty Bruce Zimmerman, uses statistical models to assess probabilities in high profile chess events. Uh, he helped us out as we talked about the World Championship last year, and I think I certainly learned from it and enjoyed it, and I think a lot of listeners did as well. So for the second biggest event on a chess calendar or in a non-world championship year, possibly the biggest event, the candidates, we are excited to welcome back uh, accountant slash uh, chess data scientist Ty Pruz Zimmerman. How's it going, Ty? Going good. Good. And Ty, as I said moments ago before we hit record, just want to thank you because uh, listeners should know Ty's working a bit ahead of schedule. Here we are recording on May 28th. It's about uh, a few weeks out from the candidates and Ty is just recovering from writing about and sharing data about the Chessable Masters. So uh, Ty, thank you for for taking the time to to look ahead with us. Happy to be here. Yeah. And Ty, you flagged some interesting things already just in our sort of preliminary conversation. So maybe we could start by your sharing with the listeners what's different about trying to assess um, statistical favorites in the candidates in particular. So it's hard to say what is different per se. Um, That's outside the scope of the numbers. But what the numbers show me is that ELO just doesn't predict the winner of candidates tournaments very well. Um, Why is hard to say. I have some theories, but theories aren't really what I like to deal in. But the numbers show that there's just no guarantee the highest rate of player wins or i mean there's never a guarantee but more so than other tournaments performance rating and results and who wins and who finishes at the top of the table almost completely disconnected from ratings coming in yeah interesting and again as we were saying we couldn't help but chat a little bit about it even before we press record but We're dealing with a small sample, we should say. There haven't been that many candidates to begin with. So I do find it of interest. And like you, I immediately start going to theories of why uh, ELO might be less predictive in uh, the candidates in particular. But the one thing we should caveat is like all the conclusions we draw are going to be based on small sample size, right? Yeah. So maybe it is worth mentioning a couple theories that I think are plausible. Uh, okay, and I don't have proof of these, I ha- statistical or otherwise. But one thing about ELO is it has a pretty heavy recency bias. Your most recent games affect your rating a lot more than the games you played a couple years ago. And once a player is in the candidates, it's logical that they would largely shut down in terms of showing their prep, in terms of a lot of things about how they might play. So it's reasonable to think that players might not show their current their true form in the events leading up to the candidates we saw i think an example of that theory in the recent grand chess tour event where half the field was people that are in the candidates and none of them scored over 50 percent in that tournament Mm -hmm. um and there's other examples famously people doing really badly in say white gong z and then coming in (laughs) and winning the candidates (laughs) yeah yeah, I was going to the same example. Yeah, but I mean, it. yeah, it does make some sense. I mean, uh, they had an interesting conversation on the recent Chicken Chess podcast where Jan Gustafsson was saying like, okay, maybe in this day and age, like that whole hiding their prep thing might be overblown because we're all working with the same engines. Uh, so it's not so much a matter of like unleashing novelties that you're saving for the candidates as it might have been, you know, in, in prior generations. But nonetheless, um, there's questions of motivation and, you know, it's not so much hiding prep as like, uh, maybe not playing the opening you're working on something like that. So it's not like you have some novelty you're unleashing, but nonetheless, you're not, you're not trying to maximize your win probability in the tournaments just preceding the candidates, which at the elite level, like any edge that you don't take is going to, uh, filter through to your ELO and then hurt you in the, uh, possible betting markets and the, um, and the um, your stuff like your your model based on rating. Um, any other theories you want to share, Ty, before we get to what your numbers uh, tell us? Uh, well, so not so much a theory of why ratings haven't connected, but there's one. The one other thing is, even if those fluctuations are relatively small, 
the thing about a candidates tournament is the players are all very close to each other already. So mm. if the ratings are 20, 30 points off going in, that makes a big difference in the odds because the margins are so slim because everyone's between 2750 and 2800 most of the time. And so those little error, er, those little errors in how ELO reflects a player's strength coming in magnify. And when you try to predict it, that throws it off further. And yeah, in addition to the general problems with trying to highlight, with trying to predict a tournament like this based on ELO, I want to highlight that in this particular field that we have this year, there are also reasons, several players who may be even less accurately rated than normal. Interesting. Uh, uh, based, just um, based, do you want to, based on COVID, I'm guessing? And, yeah, with COVID um, and activity, um, we have, Rajabov has played almost nothing. Now, my right. the, the odds I'm going to give you are based on their live ratings today. And there is Norway chess coming up. So his odds might actually change depending on his results right. there. Uh, but, and with it, the rest of the field. But we have no okay. data. We have no data on how yeah. he's played since the, <laughs> since before the last candidates, even. He just has not been playing chess at all. So yeah. we can predict based on his rating, but it doesn't tell us anything about 2022 Rajabov. And really, there's a very sim similar thing with Ding, unless you really trust that round of games he played in China to reflect his current playing strength. But the circumstances of those games, multiple games a day, uh, I'm not sure. You talked about whether motivation in those in tournaments mm -hmm. leading up to, to maximize. I'm not sure his opponents had so much motivation to maximize their win probability in those games either. So there's... A, a lot of room to wonder if that actually trued up his rating or was irrelevant to the sample. And Faruja hasn't played much in the last six right. months either. And then we have Nakamura, who had who had been retired until the Grand Prix. So we have essentially a very stale old rating. And then he gains points in the Grand Prix. But his current rating that we're you his current live rating is lower than his Grand Prix performance. So the question is. Is he still underrated? Was his Grand Prix performance really reflective of his current strength? Or did he overperform in the Grand Prix? Are we going to see regression to the mean? Is his current rating accurate? I don't know. So we have yeah. a whole lot of players in the field where when I actually look at their current rating, I have questions about its accuracy to begin with. Yeah. Okay. So huge asterisks uh, huge going asterisks. in. Yeah. And I agree. And that's part of what makes this up. I mean, uh, all candidates, I think, are compelling. But yeah, that, that that certainly makes it even more interesting to me than if there were like someone 50 points ahead of the field uh, in in like peak form. I mean, to me, it's a very wide range of uh, outcomes. But let's get to it, Ty. So I also pulled the most recent numbers from BWIN, uh, one of the few betting sites where I've been able to find um, uh, betting odds and converted those to probabilities. And I know that you also have your ELO-based um, um, model. And one thing I just note about the B win often these betting markets on chess are not like you can't bet a million dollars on it, you know, and obviously the more you can bet on something, the air quotes sharper, the price is going to be, but I will note that the line has moved because I had looked before and, uh, and it, it looks like Fabi's been bet up a little bit. Um, and Ding's been bet up a little bit. Anyway, I'll get to those, but let's hear your numbers, Ty. So what does, uh, what does your model assess as uh, you could just re read them one to eight in terms of uh, probability if you're up for it? Absolutely. So obviously my model is driven by ELO and the highest rated player in the field is Ding. So he is our favorite at 28.5%. Okay. And I'll, there's a note there, which 28.5% is not that high for a favorite that puts, you know, the rest of the field at 71.5. So he's really a, He's a favorite in best chances, but he's nothing near an odds-on favorite. Wide open tournament, always fun. Next is Alareza Ferrugia at 20.1%. Then I have uh, Fabiana Caruana, 14.8%. Wow, that's that's a lot low. Like, uh, yeah, a lot lower than the betting market. But go on, we'll discuss it when when we're done. 
Jan Nepomniachtchi at 9.1%. Richard Report at 8.6%. Hikaru Nakamura at 7.5%. Timur Rajabov at an even 6%. And Jan Christoph Duda at 5.3%. Okay. So the betting market is actually significantly different in a few places. Um, here are the betting market's probabilities. Ding exactly at 28%. And I actually rounded these numbers, so I shouldn't say exactly, but I'm saying the same number as you, same first two digits as you, 28%. But then it has Fabi at 24%, Ali Reza at 18%, Hakaru and Duda both at 8%, Nepo at 6%, Rapport at 4%, and Rajabov at 3%. And I should say that um, you know, if you actually bet on chess, they take a, a healthy percentage. So if you add up all the percentages in and uh, in, in uh, on the betting market, it adds up to 120 percent. But I kind of backed that out and returned it to adding up to 100 percent. So you can actually, if you bet these prices, they'd be slightly worse. But anyway, um, so a few notable changes. It seems like the market likes Fabi. Market doesn't like Rajabov. Um, and the market likes Naka a little better than your model. I have to say, I'm I, I, and I have to agree with the market on uh, on these assessments. I don't, but you know, it's all we're kind of splitting hairs, but it's still interesting to talk about. Well, and I have to agree with the market to some extent too. That's where I wanted to really open with all the caveats about using an ELO-driven model here, and highlight in particular uh, Nakamura being having better odds in the market makes a lot of sense because if you look at his performance rating at the Grand Prix that got him into this tournament, he seems seemed there like he was playing at much higher than a 2760 level. And my model just has him at the 2760 live rating that he got to. But he got to that gaining a lot of points and not catching up to his actual performance yet. And then the other person the betting market really likes is Fabi. And that is really consistent with all the conventional wisdom of the value of experience and also uh, putting a premium on players who have proven that they can win an event or, or like this before, which I'm not 100% convinced of statistically, but I'm not convinced it's false either. Um, it, it sometimes, sometimes there's conventional wisdom and the stats are just like, no, that doesn't make, that, that, that's not in the numbers. So I like to try to disprove things, and I've tried and failed to disprove that particular theory that winning previous events like this means something. I do think that it's captured in rating. I mean, you win events like this, you gain a lot of rating points. So, mm -hmm. But there is one variable that I want to highlight that another predictive model out there that I respect used, uh, the Smarter Chess uh, Pub has a prediction where they use not only current rating, but also a player's peak rating. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Shout out to Smarter Chess. And how was it different? Uh, they, well, Fabiano is the player who has a peak rating much higher than his current. Uh, yeah. The, uh, Nakamura also has a peak rating much higher than his current. So those, both of them, just like in the betting markets, their odds are much higher in Smarter Chess's model than in mine by factoring that peak rating in. And that's something it just conceptually, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, if we talk about the candidates as a very unique tournament, it's what people might save years of prep for, it, people might play differently. There's something to be said for not just looking at how people have played recently, but how good have they ever been? Because that might be the level they get back to. If And so that might speak a lot to potential. So I thought it was really interesting to use peak rating as a variable there. And if you do that, yeah. it brings you a lot closer to where the betting markets are at. And it does make sense to me, but I didn't find such compelling evidence in the small sample size we have to build anything like that into my model. Uh, I chose to just continue using the model that I've always used. I think that consistency is also valuable for people that have been following my stats for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and it's good. You know, you it defeats the purpose of a model if you're looking at the outputs and then tweaking the model to get the result that you want. You know, if you're exactly. if you're torturing the data, if you're torturing the data. So, um, so yeah, I, I commend you for that. And then yeah, we'll we'll link to um to Matt from Smarter Chess's blog post as well. Um, because yeah, I do enjoy their coverage as well, and it is worth getting different perspectives and forming your own assessment. One other thing I'd mention about the betting markets is, 
you know, something like that. Again, I don't even know how easy it is to bet on something like BWIN. I mean, they're based in, in Europe. Um, so uh, that makes it might make it harder for American chess fans to, to bet. May, some more places to bet may crop up. But anyway, there may be a factor where like, you know, in sports, like the the Lakers and the Man Uniteds, like the most popular teams tend to get bet up a little bit. They can often be overpriced relative to uh, teams that have fewer fans. And I think there could be a similar dynamic in play in a betting market where someone like Fabiano and Naka, like irrespective of their chess strength, they may just have the most fans, certainly Naka. So uh, not surprising in that regard either that he's, um, his price is going to be a little um, higher than, than it would be if you do it strictly based on ELO. And I was actually surprised his price wasn't higher than it is because he was, mm-hmm. his price was a touch higher than my ratings, but only what, like a, a couple percentage points and there's a decent a decent statistical argument for that with performance rating recently etc so he was actually um, priced pretty fairly relative to pure elo and i thought that there might be a bigger bump from his fan base yeah yeah that makes sense i mean i certainly um i don't think it's a bad price betting wise a a you know getting 12 to one or whatever it might be. Um, it wouldn't, wouldn't shock me if, uh, if uh, Nakamura won. No. Um, yeah. So uh, my last questions, Ty, and you, you know, you may want to punt on this, but if you were to, uh, the two questions are, if you were to buy one of these stocks at the price, obviously any, any bet you make, you're more likely to lose than to win. As you said, it's not like Ding is a favorite over the field. So A, if you were to buy one of these as a stock and B, who you actually would pick to win. And again, since you're making the model, I'll understand if you uh, punt, especially on the second question. Well, yeah, on the first, uh, on the first question who I'd pick, there was one player whose betting odds came in a little lower than my model. And so that's when that's always the type of thing that a modeler likes to jump at. So I'd be inclined to jump at uh, that price on Ali Reza. I think his chances are better than that, especially because the okay. 20% in my model is after losing a few rating points at a tournament that I don't think reflected his playing strength. Uh, he, he would have been closer to 25% in my model if he was still rated 2804. So Getting him at 18% in the betting market, that's an intriguing number to me. I do think, despite all the debates about experience, he certainly may not win it. Everyone is an underdog, but I think he could. I think there's a chance he's just the best player in the field right now. And we ha- he hasn't proven that yet. He would have to, He will have to in June, but there's a chance he might be. And if anyone... If anyone has a chance to really just come in and blow the field away and be much better than we thought, I think it's him. Interesting. So, the, so Ty, of course, being has not heard my conversation with Robert Hess, but listeners hopefully will have. And yeah, coming in on the other side of Robert Hess, I'll arrange a bet between you guys off air, Ty. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's what makes this fun. And yeah, someone like Ali Reza, again, wide range of outcomes. So I totally, totally get why you would buy that stock. Although I have to say, I, uh, Robert made a very compelling argument that you'll, you'll eventually be able to hear, but I mean, it, you know, it gets to what you would suspect lack of experience and the sort of gauntlet of just playing so many strong players one after another. Um, so should be interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah, you don't, your, your model speaks for itself, I guess, in terms of, uh, picking a winner. So I guess I won't, I won't force that out of you other than Ali Reza being a decent buy at 18% or whatever. All right. Well, Ty, this has been great. You're going to write I, about this as well, correct? I am. And I am going okay. to write about it. And I'm going to write about it as the tournament progresses. So that's actually, I think, a good point here. The odds at before the tournament starts are, of course, what you use in a preview. And this is the most exciting tournament on the calendar. So, of course, everyone wants a preview and we're looking forward to it. But for me, given all the uncertainty... The most interesting thing is going to be as the tournament progresses, tracking how these odds shift. That's one of the things that I've always tried very hard to do is keep those odds updating round by round and show use it to show some of the narrative of the tournament in a new way. Because uh, with the, the, the thing is with 14 rounds of chess, I don't know that too many of us have a great intuitive sense of how important an early win or loss really is. 
Um, you're watching a football game and you see a first quarter touchdown. If you've watched a lot of football, you, you have a pretty good sense of what that did to like the odds of winning the game. But I think when it comes to the odds of winning a chess tournament like this, a lot of fans might not have a great intuition for how important, how much of a swing it is when there's a decisive game early versus in the middle versus late. So that's one of the things that I really try to do is keep those odds updated every round and watch those swings and see who, as they win a couple games, takes over as the favorite, how overwhelming of a favorite might they become, how far back do they fall if they then lose a game. And that shifting narrative throughout the tournament is, I think, a bigger value added that I'm able to provide than my initial odds. The initial odds are a, base, are a baseline from which all of that flows. And do you have a, uh, you know, the well-documented tendency of uh, Nepo to perform worse as uh, as tournaments go on? You've got that in your model, right? <laughs> I did not build a factor for that into my model. I don't have any <laughs> player-specific factors in my model. It's all just based on their, other than their what their live rating is. Uh, I also yeah. don't have Rajabov's draw rate in my model. So okay. <laughs> that, yeah, actually, and, and and that actually might be something that I should have. That's a, If I really wanted to make it as accurate as possible, if it was meant as a betting model, not an enter... It's meant as an entertainment model. If it was right. meant as a betting model and I wanted extra complexity and to maximize accuracy, I might want some individualized draw rates. And that might be why uh, Rajabov had a little bit lower odds on the betting market. It's hard to win yeah. the tournament without winning games, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and without really trying to win, which mm -hmm. is, uh, has been an issue for him at times. Um, all right, well, Ty, this has been great. Looking forward to your coverage at Chess Numbers on Twitter. The blog is called Chess by the Numbers. If you search for it, you'll find it. You've got a Patreon page now, right, Ty? I do. Yes. Thank you for suggesting that last time we talked. Yes, yes. And and listeners, if you are a regular reader of Ties as I am, and you're able to uh, definitely recommend supporting him, um, supporting his his work as I do. So yeah, Ty, can't wait. Uh, these these last two conversations with, with you and Robert Hess have gotten me more excited. So now we get back to waiting and get back to our families here on uh, Memorial Day weekend in, uh, in the United States. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for this tournament. Okay. It's going to be amazing. Okay, thanks as always, Ty. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.